We're very lucky to have Paul Stubblebein in the museum this morning, and we'd like to talk to him about his history and drain his brain, mm. whatever there might be there. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for being part of this and wandering around this recording thing. Welcome to Austin. Thank you, and it's been a delightful morning wandering around this amazing collection. Uh, many legendary recorders, which I hadn't seen before, many recorders which I used professionally over my career. Um, it's, uh, it's been grand. So, I'm going to start from the beginning. Where yeah. did you grow up and how did you first get interested in recording? I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I went to college in Santa Cruz and when I was uh, in college, which I enjoyed very much, uh, but I wasn't sure why I was there really because I didn't really think I was going in a career path that way. I was recording my friends' bands uh, just um, as a hobby and... What were you using? I was using a little Sony 7-inch reel recorder, I don't even remember the model number. It was um, a flimsy uh, consumer recorder, nothing special whatsoever and probably the ceramic mics that came with it to start with and the recordings were really quite terrible. Uh, but um, when I started to examine what I wanted to do, I realized that's what I was doing that I loved, so I should continue to do that. As you're doing that, how did you, how did you come by that recorder? Or how did you first, when did, what was the first You know, that was not my first recorder. When okay. I was about 10, I think, um, my father's father died. We went to clean out his house and there was a webcore tape recorder and I showed interest in it, so my dad gave it to me. And uh, I took it to college with me. I was recording records. I had run across records that uh, a friend had or a professor had that interested me and I would just record some of it onto this so I could uh, hear it in my dorm room and stuff. Um, but I'd had that since, like I say, about I was 10 years old or so. and. Um, I must say, even then, at 10 years, I was fascinated with how you would get sound on this tape and be able to hear it back later. It just, you know, was uh, one of those things that just seemed amazing to me and, and it really has never stopped. Was that the first time you heard yourself recorded? Or did you record? I don't even remember recording my own voice, to be honest. I probably did, but I don't re remember that. But. Um, I do remember just being amazed that you could record and and then hear it back later. Um, so anyway, that takes me up to college. I was uh, I was not using that recorder, but a uh, Sony that I got somehow. Uh, the the Mac the uh, uh, first recorder, of course, was a mono. The stereo uh, the Sony was stereo, um, and I was making bad recordings. Uh, I don't know the. Bands might have been bad too. Maybe, maybe it's best that those recordings are lost. But in any case, uh, I was interested in doing it and um, through a mutual friend, I found out that a, a guy was, uh, that I knew was working for a band, the Sons of Champlin, was one, one of the bands in the San Francisco rock explosion and some of the guys I'd gone to high school with, I knew something about the band and my friend was doing their sound work and wanted uh, someone to work with him. And so I moved back up to the Bay Area and uh, started working with uh, my friend Bruce Walford. We built a sound system to travel with this band and we were both more interested in recording really than live sound. We were very interested in music and um, live sound was loads of fun, but we were more interested in recording and we would take our recorders out and record the shows quite a bit sometimes recording the PA feed on one channel and throw up a couple other mics to get the other instruments recorded on the other channel. Um, once again, not great recordings, but it was clear this is what we liked doing. Were you still and, using a Sony? Or uh, no, at that point, well, probably a different Sony. Uh, Bruce had a couple of seven inch quarter track machines one a Sony and one a Viking 88. Uh, very similar to that one right down there. <laughs> and um, anyway, the band broke up. We decided what we wanted to do was concentrate on the recording. We were already taking our gear to our friend's uh, band house or rehearsal room or whatever and recording our friend's bands um, 
Freedom Highway and several others. And um, we lucked into a location to build a studio, a, a disused church in San Anselmo, California. And we got access to this and we moved in and with a lot of volunteer labor from our circle of friends, we converted it into a recording studio and started recording. Um, eventually recorded the Sons there as well, the Sons of Champlin. Shortened their name to the Sons for a while. <laughs> and, uh, but other local bands, uh, Beefy Red, the Hereford Heartstringers, Hereford Heartstringers, uh, probably no one has ever heard of, but one of the members of it became a member of Huey Lewis in the News. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was a wonderful time and a wonderful place. And there we were uh, making recordings. We did a few live broadcasts on the local FM station as well. Um, it was just a hotbed of music. And uh, there we were uh, having a great time. Uh, we started recording uh, two to two, meaning we would on one seven inch reel machine record the band uh, in a stereo spread. Then in order to overdub the vocals, we would play that tape back through our mixers, little Shure mixers, pile of three of them to get left, right, and center, wow. and add the microphones in and record the, some of those things onto another recorder. So it was the, the Viking through the Shure mixers to the Sony. That's how we started making our recordings. Then we got a Ampex 350 mono and we used that to mix if we were making a mono version and in fact the first record I ever worked on that came out on vinyl was a seven inch single that we recorded to the uh, that way to the uh, 350 mono and it came out as a mono seven inch single a band called Flying Circus uh, part of the uh, Muir Beach uh, music scene, the two sister bands there, uh, Clover and Flying Circus. Uh, members of that band are still friends of mine today, and this was going back more than a couple of years. I started saying that. What period was that? This was uh, 1970 that we moved into the studio. Started working with Bruce and the Sons of Champlin in 1969, and uh, they broke up then. Uh, uh, and we moved into this studio in January of 1970 and started building it. And we did this for about three years. And then uh, both Bruce and I were getting a little frustrated that here we were trying to teach ourselves something we didn't know. And we felt maybe we'd be better off if we were working with people who knew what they were up to. So uh, I went to work at CBS. I was very fortunate. A friend of ours who had uh, helped us build the studio got in at the CBS studio in San Francisco. They had, um, well, they had started signing bands in San Francisco. It was the beginning of the rock explosion there. And a lot of labels came in and wanted to have studios in town. Um, and uh, they actually leased most of a big facility that Bill Putnam had just finished building for his uh, operation. He had, of course, United and Western in Hollywood. But he had a company in San Francisco, Coast Recorders, mm -hmm. and had built a beautiful new studio facility on uh, Mission Street, um, Folsom Street rather, and um, wound up leasing most of it to CBS. And so his company had a couple of rooms still there and then took over the Mercury studio on uh, Mission Street and operated in two locations. Um, so uh, I got in there as well. My friend Phil Brown helped me get a, a job there. and. Um, Started, started really learning my craft. I was working with engineers who knew what they were doing. I was working in a proper facility built by Bill Putnam, who is, you know, the uh, one of the real inventors of recording as we know it today. Um, and I was working with uh, top engineers like Roy Halley and Roy Siegel and Glenn Kalotkin, and. Um, uh, even just as an assistant to them, I, I learned an awful lot. At that time also they uh, had uh, stereo mastering, which when I started the way you recorded was on tape and the way you put it out was on vinyl. And I didn't think twice about it, that's just the way it was done. And um, uh, they had stereo mastering, which means a lathe where we'd cut on lacquer to go to the plant to make records. And um, George Horn 
was in charge of that and he had trained first Phil to do that and they decided they wanted one more mastering guy and they looked around and said, Paul, you, they trained me in mastering. Uh, which has worked well for me. It's been really my focus uh, ever since. More than recording, more than mixing, uh, I do mastering. Um, and um, I worked in that building for 11 years after CBS decided to leave town. Uh, a producer who had moved in, actually had taken the coast portion of the building and the upstairs, which used to be um, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's studio, Zoetrope. Uh, anyway, David Rubinson, the producer, took that over for his management and publishing offices and took over one studio on the ground floor, put in the first automated console um, on the west coast for sure. Uh, and anyway, he took over the rest of the facility and we uh, uh, continued in there another six years. Um, he called it the Automat uh, to play up the fact that he had an automated console in it. Um, anyway, we did a lot of great music in those years. It was uh, really an extension of, of what I'd started with. There was still uh, a lot of energy in music and a lot of it got recorded there. A lot of it was recorded in other places in the Bay Area and many of those came through our mastering room. We were doing uh, records that had been recorded at the record plant or Wally Hyder's uh, and a few other places uh, with uh, um, bands from the area and as you know a lot of musicians gravitated towards the Bay Area uh, like Van Morrison lived there at the time and uh, he obviously had come from Scotland um, yeah, even Janis Joplin wasn't a native she right. came from Texas right. Right. Um, how, how involved were the artists in the mastering process? Usually very little. Right. Uh, it was, this was the, um, the transition. I didn't realize uh, how significant at the time, but several transitions were going on. Uh, one was the transition away from label-owned studios. Uh, in the beginning, you know, you couldn't make a record unless you were signed to a label because they had everything. The, right. the recording studio, the distribution, and everything. That started to crack with the beginning of independent studios. And I was working in a label-owned studio at the time. There was a lot of independent studios as well. But there wasn't much in the way of independent mastering. That really started with Doug Sachs opening the mastering lab right about that same time, 1969, 68, whenever he did that. And then Bernie Grunman was working in a label-owned studio and he moved and opened his own mastering studios. So mastering was transitioning from what was considered just a technical step in the manufacturing of records into another creative step at the end of the studio process. And um, uh, one of the engineers I got to work with, Fred Gutera, one of the absolute great engineers ever, um, when he started for Columbia Records back in New York, the first job in the studios was mastering. They'd take guys out of the warehouse or wherever they arrived from and put them in mastering because it was ear training. You would get a tape made by people who knew what they were doing. Your job was to translate it on the record and lose as little as possible. And you had to listen and find out what was going on, figure out what to adjust to get the most of it on there. So it was not a creative process in the way that it became later. And as I say, I was in this transition, uh, although I was in a label-owned studio and then automated independent studio, um, this was the years when you'd get to the end of the mixing and then you'd sit back and say, I wonder if somebody who's not close to the record would have some suggestions that might make it even better. And that was the beginning of mastering as a creative step. And uh, now it is very much considered that. Uh, it's assumed that the mastering step will um, put the final polish on and bring things out of the recordings uh, that weren't there, uh, weren't evident before. Um, uh, Bob Ludwig, one of the great mastering engineers ever, describes it as the ability to listen to it, sense what could be there, and know what knobs to turn to get it out of the, the mixes. Uh, so that's what mastering really is mm -hmm. today. Um, I, I saw a brief thing on, you, on YouTube talking about sometimes the original mm -hmm. content 
It's not something you can <laughs> enhance. Yeah. What do you do on times like that, especially if it's a known group or something? You just do well, the best you can. Well, you always do the best you can, and sometimes you're enhancing, and sometimes you're trying to sweep things under the rug <laughs> um, and make it sound like you didn't. You're always trying to make it sound like you never touched it. Um, when someone listens to the recording, I don't even want them to listen and say, man, that's great engineering. You know, if, if they're listening to the engineering, I've sort of failed. I really just want them to be taken away by the music. Uh, so when I do mastering, if I'm changing EQ, for instance, I do whatever EQ I think is going to bring things out, and then I give it another listen, a second listen, and say, am I doing anything that makes something poke out in a way that sounds unnatural? And maybe I can shade it a little here and there to just make it sound like that's the way it always was. That's generally my goal. Um, that's uh, an old-fashioned approach now. Uh, things have changed so much that uh, people really want things to sound like they're affected fine, but uh, I came up in a time where we were really trying to make it sound like the band was out in front of you or the vocalist was out in front of you, right. so forth. What, what styles did you work with through this period? What, was it, did it matter? Well, we were doing mostly rock because that's what was going on. I mean, it's pretty broadly defined. Um, I mean, I during this period of time, I did probably six records with Herbie Hancock, and he was just doing jazz at the beginning, and he was doing fusion and funk at the end, but uh, um, we were, of course, happy to work on anything, but what was going on in San Francisco at the time was uh, rock, and then some of the stuff that came into San Francisco from outside as well. I did a few records with uh, Blue Oyster Cult, they were an East Coast band, but that's rock. Uh, one record with The Clash, who had come to San Francisco to record. They recorded at the Automat, and then I mastered that record. Um, Is this still with CBS? No, this was uh, afterwards, uh, uh, right after CBS left town, and uh, uh, it was the Automat okay. at the time. Yeah. So you stayed there? I stayed there, yes. My friend Phil Brown, he, we were split in time. He'd do one shift, I'd do the other shift at CBS. He got recruited after the, uh, the um, CBS left town and it became the Automat. He worked there another couple of months. But he got recruited to go to uh, Warner's uh, studio in North Hollywood where he cut for a long time. So, um, but I stayed on and um, actually did a little studio recording as well, not so much at the Automat, a few things there, but uh, I had a studio in uh, Sonoma County and then a studio in Sausalito, so I was a busy guy, going back and forth, doing cutting at uh, the Automat and recording, mixing, what have you, at these other studios. Um, again, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, got, to, got to mix a, a, a really memorable bluegrass album at the studio in uh, San Francisco, Peter Rowan's uh, Walls of Time album. Uh, mixed that, he had recorded it in Nashville and we mixed it in Sausalito and I mastered the LP at, uh, at the Automat. Uh, so, time and location. Uh, yeah, so wow. yeah. Um, and uh, well, as I say, at that time we didn't think much about the format. You just recorded on tape, and when it was ready to go out to the public, it got cut on LP. That's what it was. In sh shortly after I started in mastering, though, uh, cassette became a release format as well. And it was a minor release format for several years, but it became quite popular and eventually was outselling LPs. So we were mastering for both simultaneously. I'd be cutting the LP master and running a tape copy, which would then go to the cassette plant. Uh, we ran a lot of tape copies because they went to a couple plants and then they went to the overseas affiliates and stuff. It was typical to run six or seven uh, tape copies while I was cutting LP sides. Uh, not just me, this was standard in the entire industry. So we went through a lot of tape. Um, we had, uh, CBS wasn't sure about moving from 16 to track to 24 track. They delayed a while. In fact, um, we had probably the first working rig with two 16 tracks synced together with time code. The time code uh, had been developed really for video, but there were local companies that were close to Ampex, for instance, and there was an Ampex spin-off that was 
trying to link machines together with this time code and they brought these controllers in and we linked two MM16 uh, uh, tracks, MM1000, 16 tracks together and uh, that would give us 30 tracks because you had to give up one track on each machine for time code. And uh, this was done, uh, Roy Halley was really interested in having more tracks uh, for this uh, Art Garfunkel route album he was doing. He had done all the Simon and Garfunkel records. He did the Paul Simon for a solo album there and then he did the Garfunkel solo album there. And so they had the system working pretty well. We used it on a lot of re uh, records. Um, then uh, eventually the whole industry just standardized on 24 track and we just had to do it. Um, that, that changed quite a bit for you though, going into then now doing multiple yeah. tracks. Coming it's in. a very different way of recording and uh, with uh, some good points and some bad points. The uh, move to 24 track had uh, on a technical level a real compromise. Uh, if you've ever looked at the uh, size of the tracks on record heads, I'm sure you have, um, in the beginning quarter inch mono was the standard and when they went to stereo on quarter inch the track got quite a bit narrower. You didn't just cut it in half, you had to have a big guard band in the middle or you'd have crosstalk. So it got quite a bit narrower but it was still fine. And we kept that spacing as we went up to four track on half inch and eight track on one inch and 16 track on two inch. They were all that same width of the track, all good. When they tried to put 24 track on two inch tape, they had to give up so much for those guard bands. That now the tape track is really skinny. As a result, the sound's not as fat and the noise is more prevalent. And, um, here I'm, I'm going, I'm getting up on the soapbox. I can feel myself climbing up here, but the, uh, I, I'm not decrying the creative potential of having more tracks. I'm just saying on a technical level, that's when people started worrying about noise on tape, really. And um, uh, Dolby was already introduced before that. People, Some people used that as a way to combat the tape issue. But the tape manufacturers started trying to make high output tapes so you could print more signal on the tape so the noise would be less evident. Um, we didn't know at the time what that was going to do, but that led to the tapes which now are degrading in storage. A huge problem in the record industry. I'm not going to go through the entire story now. It's been well documented, but in my view, that's what really pushed this change to the higher output tapes. And the changes in the chemistry they had to make in those binders to hold more magnetic particles is what led to these unstable binders. Um, uh, there you go. As long as I'm on the soapbox, I'll say there's one other thing that made uh, noise more uh, objectionable on tape and that was the move to solid state. If you have a, a good properly built tube tape recorder aligned the same way as a good properly built solid state recorder, the solid state recorder sounds noisier to my ear. And if it's an IC based recorder it sounds noisier yet. They may all measure the same but for reasons I cannot explain the tape noise is more objectionable on the solid state recorder and even more so on the IC based recorder, which fueled the uh, push towards higher output tapes as well as the uh, push to better noise reduction noise systems, reduction. Which, right. which also improved over the years. Right. Wow. So. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, where did you go next? After well, after the. Um, the Automat, we had, we had started doing some digital recording there. We did one record with the 3M digital system, recorded, uh, I didn't record it, Leslie Ann Jones recorded it with uh, David Rubens producing a Carlos Santana solo album, recorded the 3M 32 track digital, uh, mixed to the 3M 4 track digital and I cut the LPs on that. We had a very early Sony two track system based on video recorders, the PCM1, People have seen the F1, that 
was a consumer version of that, but the PCM1 and then the PCM100 used video recorders and we had to have two of them running in sync offset in order to get the preview signal for the lathe. That was the only time I've ever had assistant engineers in mastering because we had this huge rig to run. Um, so you're still doing that using videotape and still going to vinyl yes. in masters? Right? Yes. Oh. Uh, so anyway, we knew the digital uh, technology was coming and in 1983 the uh, CD was introduced in the United States and uh, Right about then, um, the owner of the studio, David Rubinson, had a, a massive heart attack and he had to cut back and what he cut back was the studio. Um, he, uh, he tried to sell it, couldn't find anyone who would run it at the level of professionalism that he had always maintained there, so he simply closed it. So there I was um, at the uh, beginning of the CD era, the uh, equipment for uh, mastering CDs I thought was brain dead. It was this videotape based system and to edit you needed two machines and a video controller essentially and it was horrendously expensive. So I did not invest at that time. I went off, I did a few other things. I freelanced for a couple of years and then uh, also because I knew that workstations were coming. I had a couple of different friends involved in making uh, early workstations. A friend of mine who had been an Ampex engineer uh, was inventing one came out uh, called the Diaxis, probably the first uh, commercially available workstation which actually worked and um, uh, other friends uh, with a little company called uh, Sonic Solutions that were making a workstation for mastering. So I knew that was coming so I just waited it out till they were real and then I started a mastering lab called the Rocket Lab with a partner that I'd had in a recording studio previously and uh, all in San Francisco. I've done projects outside of San Francisco, but my career has always been in San Francisco. And uh, we ran that for about five years. Uh, my partners and I, well, our interests diverged, so I said, okay, fine, you go your way, I'll go mine, and I've been uh, running my own shop ever since. I moved over to the old Wally, Wally Hyder studio, and uh, built my mastering lab there and I was working there with two other engineers, uh, John Greenham and Michael Romanowski, both of work, had worked with them at the Rocket Lab. We needed a little more space, so we moved over to uh, the Coast Recorders on Mission Street, the old uh, uh, facility that had been built by Mercury and then rebuilt by Bill Putnam. After Putnam uh, retired and his company uh, broke up, it had been through two different owners and the last ones were leaving and we moved in there. We didn't take over the recording studio at first, we just took up another part of the building and built two mastering labs and uh, operated there for a long time. In fact, Michael Romanowski still operates that whole facility. Um, and John Greenham has moved on to uh, LA, he's still mastering as well. But anyway, that's what I did. I worked there in, in mastering for, uh, and a little bit of recording as well because we had this beautiful studio um, uh, for quite a long time. Now I've just uh, moved my shop down to Pacifica next door to my uh, uh, best client, Reference Recordings, where I, I do LP mastering for them and uh, uh, a little bit of mastering for uh, clients, not nearly so much as I used to and a little bit of mastering for a um, venture called The Tape Project. Right. Was it time to talk about that? Yeah, how did you just get into that? Well, it, I'll tell you the story. Um, I had been working on the new formats as they came along, working with people trying to improve the digital formats, and we were, they were making real progress. The digital was getting better and better and better. Um, but every once in a while, I'd be working on a digital project and it would be coming from tape, and I'd go, the tape, it sounds so satisfying. The digital, yeah, it's getting better, but it doesn't satisfy me in the same way. And it was one of the things about my work life that was a, a little less than satisfying. During this period, um, a friend of mine in uh, Washington State who has a company making tube audio equipment for the home constructor. He's kind of the new Heath kit, the new Dyna kit. 
called Bottlehead Corporation, okay. and his stuff is wonderful, wonderful sounding stuff, but it's made for the do-it-yourself or in the home constructor. And he ran a conference every few years called the Vacuum State of the Art Conference. F fabulously interesting people from around the world sharing an interest in tube audio. And um, I would go to them, and they were always worth going to, and I always wanted to contribute something. So one year I hauled a whole lot of equipment up, including my one-inch two-track <laughs> analog machine, and played for the people there, high-res digital, the best we could do, high-res uh, DSD, you know, the, the format right. that was on the SACD, and high-res uh, analog, the best we could do. And the next time he did the uh, conference, I said, Dan, I want to uh, contribute again, but I just don't want to haul all this stuff. Could we <laughs> think of something else? He said, um, well, could you maybe transfer a couple of master tapes directly to CD for my demo room? This year I want my demo room to really sound good. I said, well, I could, I'd be happy to if that's what you want, but CD, maybe we could do tape. And uh, Dan said, well, I've got a friend here in, in Seattle uh, that uh, is really into Ampex. I don't know if you know uh, um, this guy. Uh, his, uh, is a big Ampex maven in, in Seattle. And um, maybe I can get him to put a machine together. So we did a 350-351 combination wow. somehow. And I said, okay, it might be a little noisy. Maybe I should do it at 30 ips just to be safe. So I made a bunch of one-off copies, 30 ips, uh, two-track, quarter-inch, took it up, and my partner, Michael Romanowski, came up to the conference with me, and we played tape in his demo room. And they played CDs, and they played vinyl. Uh, everyone at the show had a, a really well-put-together vinyl rig, and there was a lot of modified uh, CD players and the like, and people would bring them around after hours to listen to the CD rig in somebody else's room and stuff. And um, it was exciting uh, to be with people that care about audio and care about music. And through these three days, we listened to a lot of different music on a lot of different rigs. Every time we played the tape, it was just killer. It just wiped the floor with every other format. And um, I wasn't surprised that it sounded good, but I was sort of surprised how much better it sounded than the best we could do for the home listener on all these other formats. And over time, Dan and, and Romo and I just kicked this around, around the fireplace, uh, uh, and we started thinking, do, do we have the resources to make something like this work that we could put out tapes and we realized we had an unusual collection of resources that we knew all the people who make tape machines that we knew the people who make tape we i've worked with enough reissue labels i had watched people license music from the labels i hadn't done it myself but i had people who would help me um, we thought maybe we could actually pull this off so we uh uh, made the fateful decision to go ahead. Dan, this is Dan Schmally, now one of the uh, founders and partners in the Tate Project, uh, put up a website describing things. I went out and got a couple of licenses. We designed um, graphics for the reel itself. You know, we've got a custom reel, we've got nice packaging and so forth. And we announced it. And uh, said, here's the deal, you're going to have to subscribe because we need your money to make this work. So uh, we started accepting money uh, for these uh, um, tapes at a um, very curious point in history where there was nobody in the world making tape. Right. Uh, this was when uh, the European tape companies, Bassef and Agfa, had been sold, merged, uh, I mean, the chemical companies were still right. rolling, but they had sold off tape, sold to a company in Turkey, bought out of bankruptcy by somebody in um, the Netherlands, and they were going to make tape, but they weren't making tape today. Right. This was right when um, the employees at Quantigy came to work in Opelika, Alabama, the first day of January, and the gates were padlocked. They had gone into bankruptcy suddenly.
And uh, ATR, we knew, was starting the project of making tape, and we know these guys forever, and we believed that they were serious, but they'd been announcing for five years and didn't have tape. So it was kind of a, an odd thing to do. Let's put it this way. It's odd to think that we could sell 15 IPS studio grade tape copies from the masters in the first place, which would have to be expensive. There's no way around that. And then to do that right at the point there was nobody making tape. Well, it worked out. Uh, RMGI got their rig in uh, the Netherlands up and running. They made some BASA formulas, some AGVA formulas. We chose the 468, which was uh, originally a um, AGFA formula, was originally their low print through tape. And that's what we started duplicating on. And uh, not long after that, uh, I don't know how long, but in geologic terms, of just the blink of an eye, um, ATR got their tape in production. And so now uh, we have uh, some of the best tape that we've ever had in my experience in the business being made right today here in the you know sunset years of the tape format we have some of the best tapes being made we're now duping on the uh, ATR master tape uh, but we used thousands of miles of the uh, 468 from RMGI and it was always great too um, they they sold it again and it's now being manufactured in France uh, but during the changeover period we just stabilized on on the ATR. What are the machines you're using? For? Our process um, is that we get the original master tape from the, record company? from the record company. In every case but one we have used the original master tape. Uh -huh. By that we mean if it was a multi-track recording when they were mixing the song there was a two-track recorder over there recording it and that's the tape we get. You know of course they cut the songs together they did in the old days. Now we get piles of 10 tapes and we have to sift through them. If it was a location recording uh, or a straight to two track recording like the Rudy Van Gelder recordings, then the musicians were out there, some microphones, a console, and there's a tape machine right there. That's the tape we work from. There was one exception uh, which we got sort of uh, backed into. The Linda Ronstadt title we put out, Heart Like a Wheel, we love the music, we wanted very much to put that title out. We had signed the papers and we had paid our advance. And then I went to pick up the tape and I said, wait, this isn't the master tape, this is a copy, an EQ copy made for LP cutting. Can you pull up the master tape? Uh, to condense a very long story, that tape has been missing since 1975. And it was recorded in 1974 mastered from the originals and that original was signed back into the capital uh, tape vaults and later you know months later uh, someone was doing a greatest hits album and wanted a few things off it they could not find the original master tape so everything that's come out on that record since has come from well we found a better tape copy thankfully we were steered towards a flat copy that was just a one-to-one -one, it's the best that exists so in that case, we work from a copy. Otherwise, every single thing that we've put out started with the original master tape. And we take it into the mastering room. We do a normal mastering process, which is listen to it, see does it need a little nudge here and there, does it need a tweak that will make the music present better. And if so, we do, and if not, we transfer it flat. And we make uh, running masters on analog, one inch, two track. What machine? That machine that we do the recording on is an Ampex ATR100 that has uh, elect electronics custom made by EAR in England, Tim DePeravicini's company, and flux magnetic heads. Uh, it's a pretty nice sounding tape machine. Um, then we uh, play the running masters in real time to a bank of recorders. These are uh, Ampex ATR100s that we have, uh, well, we've modified a little bit, mainly just simplifying the signal path uh, where um, 
possible where we can leave out certain things. They had switchable speeds, we're running one speed, so we took a couple of FET switches out, little things like that. But basically Ampex ATR 100s. Our playback machine today is, for those one inch uh, running tapes, is um, a Studer A80 with a Flux Magnetics uh, one inch two track playback head that was custom built by Flux Magnetics to match Ampex MR70 electronics, which have been uh, modified and cleaned up slightly by Tim DePeravicini. So that is our signal chain. That tape machine to a passive splitter that feeds the, the uh, recorders. Uh, all in real time, it's as simple and direct as we can. We're trying to keep the life the um, texture, the flavor crystals uh, of the original recording as much as possible. We're making this for people who love the music and enjoy it even more in its most vibrant form. That's what, what the tape project is about. That's cool. Uh, what, have you run into masters that were just Impossible Unfortunately, do? yes. We have had, we, we got much more careful now. We don't turn over the check till we know that there's an original master and it's playable. Uh, and there's uh, many things we've wanted to put out and can't because either the masters are damaged, degraded, or missing. There's a huge problem with missing masters. Um, during uh, a long stretch as labels got sold to other labels, you know how that works, the, the big labels agglomerate the smaller labels. Um, and the big, big labels tend to be uh, run largely by accountants and lawyers. And a lot of times the accountant said, why are we paying to store eight different copies of this? Let's trim it down, just hold on to one and they oftentimes not hold on to the right one. It, there's many cases that that's happened. And um, since we want to only work from the original master, we've had to say no to uh, a lot of things that we'd like to do musically. And you know, we may uh, put out another series at some time where we relax that standard just to be able to put out the best that can be done today with some great music titles. That's that's a possibility later, but that, that a, really, have you done? Have you had any interaction with Neil Young with his Pano project or anything? Like no, um, no, I haven't. Of course, his uh, project is to move that all to digital. Uh, had a little interaction with him on that, but um, I'm thinking about uh, going to Neil and saying, "Love what you're doing with the digital side." How would you like some of your best work to be represented at its best? Because he can hear the difference. I know yes, that. Yeah. yeah. Leo Degar Kolka was a colleague of mine in San Francisco at the time he uh, had started in the record business in Hollywood, but had moved to San Francisco and opened a studio, uh, Golden State Recorders, and um, it was an independent studio, but one of the first real studios in San Francisco, and. Um, I'd been in there many times uh, observing sessions. I don't think that I actually ever did a session there. But I knew Leo very well, and because he was also a disc cutter, uh, we were part of a very small fraternity. There was, uh, you know, in San Francisco, cutting discs, George Horn, Phil Brown, myself over at Columbia. For a brief while, there was a mastering place in uh, Sausalito as well, but didn't last very long. And there was Leo and uh, the guy he trained, Ken Lee. Uh, and that was it. So we all knew each other. We were all friends. Uh, eventually Ken Lee came to work with us at Rocket Lab too and now he's independent and, and doing very well. Uh, still mastering. Good guy, good friend. Um, but it was, um, as I say, a small fraternity. Right. And uh, Leo was a character. <laughs> Leo uh, was uh, famous for his kind of uh, imperial manner with the bands. He was recording, you know, these hippies in San Francisco. That's what was going on then. And he would browbeat them. And, uh, you know, his, his talk back into the studio was really loud. Plus it had the tone in it. You know, we used to have a low frequency tone to slate the tapes. It made it into his talk back. So when he hit the talk back, 
he'd come on with this booming voice, there'd be this low frequency tone at the same time and it was really loud and he would say, give me something clean and original. I want clean and original. And uh, anyway, he was uh, well loved but uh, 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 considered quite the character in the Bay Area music scene. Like I said, yeah. They called him the Baron. Yes, they called him the Baron. <laughs> Had but you, you it, said you had seen the 200A that we did? Yes, seen? he had that in the studio, in the control room when I was there. My first time in uh, there was uh, right before I started working for the Sons of Champlin. They were in there cutting their first album, and my eventual partner, Bruce Walford, was one of the two producers of that album. So I just visited and hung out on sessions with them for a while. Was in there many times since, and... Uh, um, and not only is Ken Lee still a friend, but his chief engineer, Mike Larner, still a friend as well. And um, uh, yes, he had that 200 there, and it was a working machine. It didn't get much use because it was a mono machine. Of course, people weren't doing mono, but it was still a working machine. He had a Stevens 16-track there. Saw yeah. yeah. Saw it in the storage facility. Yeah. <laughs> well... Um, John came up to visit us at our studio in Sausalito one time, hoping we'd buy one of his multi-track machines. Um, in fact, left the whole manual, which I came across recently. I'm about to scan it. Um, and uh, they were f fabulous machines, I will say. I was a, a little reluctant to buy into a machine that um, uh, needed someone to maintain it who was in L.A. The, 3Ms, Ampexes and stuff, the machines were maintained by people all over the country. Um, but I almost bought one because they really did sound good, better than uh, the machines we could buy from the other suppliers. They were really, and creative in, in how he did the transport. You know, his, you really have to credit him with the uh, pinch rollerless transport, right. which Ampex eventually developed into the ATR 100, ATR 124. Um, he had done it first. And, um, well, first for audio, there right. were instrumentation recorders maybe, and the like. But, but he was really creative in the way he did the electronics, the way he did the transports, and the results were audibly better. They were really great. Just mentioning the fact that you had known Ron Newdall, yeah. actually responsible for me getting yeah. into the doing yeah. all this. Yes, and, and I didn't really know he'd come out of Texas. Uh, when I was coming up in the Bay Area, he just was this guy that had this big company in the peninsula. They were doing a lot of things with Ampex recorders and uh, cassette duplicators, uh, you know, commercial duplication equipment uh, and the like. And um, uh, a guy that had a lot of uh, machines too. Uh, I bought a couple of machines from him um, when he was auctioning off a lot of his spare stuff. Uh, got an MCI 2 track and an ATR 100 out of that auction. So, um, he was quite a character. Yes. When did you and Connie, Connie am I correct? Yes, that's uh, right. When did she start putting up with you? <laughs> Uh, it's been 23 years, coming up on 24. Congratulations. And um, uh, this was right in the time that um, we were just about to open the uh, Rocket Lab. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, we were into the digital uh, world. Uh, Rocket Lab was a mastering lab for CDs uh, initially. We did high res stuff there afterwards, but it was high res wasn't possible yet. So we were mastering at 4416. We had uh, uh, a lot of our stuff came from tape, so we had an ATR 100 and a Studer uh, 827 side by side there in that lab. Anyway, that's when it was, and, um, and she's put up with me ever since, and, and so I'm far. Gonna, you're going to get a, uh, uh, an Ampex 100 in your kitchen? I'm sure we room? probably are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's already, it's, it's already made it into the house. It's down in the garage now. It's coming up to the, uh, to the uh, dining room where the hi-fi equipment is uh, shortly, <laughs> and it's going to be mated with a uh, uh, tube uh, playback electronics from my partner Dan Schmally, his company Bottlehead. I just finished building the kit, and uh, that's going to be home listening for us wow. to uh, tape project tapes and 
and actually I have an entire closet of uh, the tapes that I've been bringing home from the studio over the years. Uh, well known in the in studio world that recording engineers tended to take home nice quality copies of the things that they worked on and stuff. So I've got a couple of shelves of uh, tapes down there waiting uh, uh, for, a, for a proper machine to play them back and unfortunately for a little restoration as well. So I mentioned um, a friend who had been an Ampex engineer. Um, he actually was a, a partner with us in the Rocket Lab as well. But before that, he'd had a location recording van and had an ATR 100 in it. And for several years, he had the contract to record uh, concerts for a local radio station called KFAT that recorded fat fries at a club and then would play them the next weekend on the uh, radio. And I mixed half a dozen of those shows, including a couple for the Sleep at the Wheel, uh, one for Taj Mahal. And, it was fun times there, but this was in a small Econoline van with a, I think a PA console that he had modified. He's a talented engineer, so he got great sound out of it. Um, but uh, it was such cramped quarters that you were essentially kneeling in front of the console, and after the show was over, you'd have to kind of unlimber yourself <laughs> and creak out of this little Econoline van. But great times, great yeah, times. It was fun. Levon Helm, Russell Smith, and the Muscle Shoals All-Stars came through and recorded them there at the Saddle Rack in San Jose, too. Is there any story that I forgot to ask you about that you... That I can repeat? That you can Probably repeat? not. Okay. <laughs> Paul, thank you so much. I appreciate all of you spending the time here. Martin, Chris, uh, thank you so much for you hosting us uh, <laughs> yes. this morning. It's been a real treat. Well, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Crowd goes wild. <laughs>